Hi, my name is Amanda Lamond. I'm the director of the Centre for Integrative Law and founder of Wolela Women Leading Law. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about standing in your power. This talk I have prepared specifically for students who are in the mentorship program, which is run by the International Association of Women Judges, the Cape Town Provincial Division, and it's done in association with the DGRU, the Democratic Governance and Rights Unit at UCT. Um, this talk, I actually did a version of it the first time two years ago, and it was very well received because power is not something that women talk very easily about. Nor do lawyers talk much about power, although we certainly acknowledge it when it's in the room. So without further ado, let's look at our relationship with power. We are living in a fascinating time. So power structures are being challenged left, right and centre. There is a sense of instability because nobody knows quite what's going to happen next. And there's so much happening right now on this planet, which is about the balance of power. And the balance of power is working its way through all systems, which is including our family systems. And you'll not only be aware of the power struggles, struggles which are happening at the realms of government and other societal systems, but also you probably may have found that you are juggling the real issue of the balance of power in your most intimate relationships right now. So if you are, then you're not alone. In South Africa, we've been seeing the infringement of constitutional rights as a result of regulations being declared overnight um, by one or other minister. And so this question of who has the power in government is under scrutiny. We have world leaders with extraordinary power who are being exposed as not really knowing what's going on or how to manage a pandemic. Um, and the good news is that we have seen some women leaders, um, for example, Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand, who have really been shining as examples of what um, global leadership can look like. And it's been the women who are stepping up to the plate. However, we also have situations like Jay-Z now running for president. And what does that tell us about what society regards as powerful? We are certainly living in interesting times. The Black Lives Matter movement reflects the current social zeitgeist, challenging the power structures of a world which is built on white supremacy. The Black Lives Matter Foundation uh, is a global organization in the US, UK and Canada and sometimes it's necessary to distinguish between the actual foundation and the movement because the movement is far greater than the actual organization that is called the Black Lives Matter Foundation. Um, the foundation says that their mission is to eradicate white supremacy and build local power to intervene in violence inflicted on black communities by the state and vigilantes. So massive shifts happening all around the world in every sphere in terms of power relations right now. If we turn to the legal profession and power, this image is of the top 10 rated lawyers at the Merrill Lynch Investment Bank in 2013. This is what the power in law has traditionally looked like. So very white and very male, but this is changing. And um, I hope that I'll be able to find a picture of what the the top investment banks leaders at the moment in 2020 look like, because I'm hoping that we're gonna see a very different profile. Things are changing. So lawyers have great power and with power comes great responsibility. But it's been curious to me for a long time why lawyers aren't taught about this. There are universities um, internationally that have embraced teaching lawyers about leadership who have realized that lawyers are naturally going to be leaders in society by virtue of their role. However, there are many that, that are not, that aren't including any uh, subjects around leadership, around self-management, around your own leadership style, what it means to actually govern and lead others. And to me, that's an enormous failure. We're sending people out into the world with law degrees who will, many of them, become powerful leaders, and yet we're not equipping them with any of the skills. So I don't know if you want to take a moment to just reflect on your own um, university um, progression right now, and has anybody spoken to you about leadership and about your power and about how to harness your own power? And if not, why not? 
And why is space not being made for this? And if you do have mentors or lecturers who are discussing that, go and ask for more. So I want to share a wonderful quote with you, which is from this man called Robert Benham, who was appointed the first African-American to serve as Chief, Chief Justice of the Georgia Supreme Court in 1989. It was a big deal as an African-American because Georgia is one of the southern states in America. So for those of you who don't know, they only abolished slavery like a couple of years ago. So to be appointed as an African-American man to, as Chief Justice was an enormous accomplishment. And he's a wonderful, a ma wonderful man. So he said, there are three fundamental professions found in all civilized societies. The medical profession, which heals the body, the clergy, which heals the soul, and the legal profession, which properly understood heals breaches in the social fabric. I love that quote when I saw it because something really resonated with me around the, the poetry of the way he, he put that, but that the legal profession's role is to heal breaches in the social fabric. And when we see our role like that, it's an incredibly important role and one which we should regard perhaps, you know, as a sacred duty in terms of what we are doing for people's relationships, for the country and for the world. And I feel like that is also something that's missing in the way people regard law today. It's certainly not just a way to get rich. And as you know, lawyers work very, very hard for their bucks. Um, it's no longer a profession that I would say, if you want easy money, you, you go be a lawyer. I think that's a misnomer. That was an idea. Um, although there are certainly some who still charge very, very, very exorbitant rates per hour, but that's another subject. But this idea that lawyers are actually there to serve the greater good and heal breaches in the social fabric. I want you to hold on to that and question in your own life, is that true for you? So what is power? I mean, we know power when we see it but, or, or hear it, but it's actually kind of difficult to define power. If we look at a dictionary definition, it says the ability or capacity to do something or act in a particular way. I will do everything in my power to help you, for example, or his powers of concentration. It's also the capacity or ability to direct or influence the behavior of others or the course of events. For example, a political process that offers people power over their own lives, or an expression like, she had me in her power. It also refers to political or social authority or control, especially that exercised by a government. So you talk about the party had been in power for eight years. It can also refer to physical strength and force exerted by something or someone. So we talk about the power of the storm or it could be a surge of power from an electrical engine. But you may have noticed this word capacity comes up quite a lot. And I just wanna to turn to that for a moment because I see there as being these two quite distinct aspects of power. The one is the being and capacity, and the other is more about doing and performance. So there's a more internal one, and then there's the more external, out in the world, performance-based one. So the being and the doing. You get powerful beings, and then you get people who are powerful in terms of the actions they're able to accomplish in the world. A very important part of the message I want to share with you today is this, that women fear their own power. Women have an uneasy relationship with power. We admire it. So we admire powerful women like Oprah or Leona Tirana, constitutional court judge, or Tuli Madonsela, Jacinda Ardern, New Zealand Prime Minister, Beyonce, Michelle Obama. And we might be envious of their fame and their popularity maybe, or their influence. But yet the subject of power is not something that women talk easily about. So why is this? Well, women are programmed to believe that having power comes at the expense of something else. And that something else is usually relationships. So we are actually biologically wired and socially programmed. So the two, biologically wired and socially programmed to value maintaining rela relationships and people's feelings and their needs and preventing harm. If you look at the neuroscience around the female brain versus the male brain, it's fascinating because in all the sections which are responsible for 
connections and emotions and you know the connections being the relationship part of the brain women have far more of those there's an intensity clustered when you look at the activity in the brain and so that's why we're saying that the neuroscience actually shows that women are biologically programmed the role we play in society and are meant to is that of relationships and connection and holding things together which is why when we look at societal groupings while men are out there fighting wars, it's women who are keeping society together and keeping things going. And I think if you're aware of what's going on at this time during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we're certainly seeing that, that there are women who are holding the country together in many ways. Um, so women fear their own power because we fear that stepping into our power will mean that we lose the relationships that we value the most. And we are both biologically wired and culturally and socially programmed to put the relationships first. So we believe stepping into our power is going to cost us. And we may believe that consciously, and we may believe it subconsciously. But the issue is that not stepping into our power actually costs us more. There is a time in our lives, usually at midlife, when a woman has to make a decision possibly the most important psychic decision of her life. And that is whether to be bitter or not. Women often come to this in their late 30s or early 40s. They are at the point when they are full up to their ears with everything and they've had it and the last straw has broken the camel's back and they are pissed off and pooped out. Their dreams of their 20s may be lying in a crumple. They may be with broken hearts, broken marriages, broken promises. This quote is from Clarissa Pinkola Estes uh, from the book, Women Who Run With the Wolves. It is an extraordinary book. I will tell you that it's quite a hard book to read because it is very detailed and it goes into myth and fairy tale and legend and looks at some of the extraordinary um, fairy tales and myths that have been passed down um, along the years and what they say about women and what's going on in the subconscious. But it is an extraordinary book. So even if you just dip into a few pieces of it, it is the type of book where you'll find that you're highlighting every single page because there's so many quotable bits of it that, that everything feels important. And it is regarded as, um, yes, as an extraordinarily powerful, unusual and life-changing book. So... As you'll see here, it's quite often only in their 30s and 40s that women start thinking about their relationship with power and what they've given up to get to where they are or the paths they didn't take. And so the reason that I'm now starting to work with younger women in their 20s is because I'm saying you can learn from us. You don't need to make all the same mistakes. So understanding your power and figuring out what your power is and then standing in that power is possibly the most important psychic decision of your life. If you haven't thought about it enough until this point, I encourage you to do so now. Let's look a little bit at more detail at this issue of power versus force, because very often the two are confused. So power is a more still thing. For example, gravity. It doesn't have to be justified. It is complete. It requires nothing from the outside. Power energizes, it gives forth, it supplies. Power is self-evident. So you don't have to explain it. For example, like health is more powerful than disease. You can't argue that it is. The concept of health is more powerful. It doesn't mean that disease doesn't sometimes triumph. Faith is more powerful than doubt. Things head towards the thing that has power. Then if we look at force, force is always moving against something. Force has to be justified. It constantly needs to be fed energy. Force consumes energy as well. It's arguable. And the goals of force are transient. Okay, they change. Again, back to power. Power can motivate us end endlessly. If our lives are dedicated, as just an example, to enhancing the welfare of everyone we come into contact with or to serving justice, then we can be motivated by that power our entire lives. So the source of power is associated with meaning. Whereas with force, the goals of force are transient. So I want to get this title or that position. It's just momentary and then you attain it and then you're looking for something else. And what happens after we get that then? Well, we, we become demotivated or disillusioned very often because we're using force to try and get things. 
where does power come from? Well, if we look at it very simply, there are two types of power. There's the externally conferred power. So, you know, you're given the title and that's, you're given power from the outside world, recognizing you. And then there's this other side, which is your internal power. And that's the side that you can probably tell from the way I talk that excites me more. It's this internal journey. It's this what's going on in the subconscious because that in the end has more effect on our lives than things from the outside. What we're taught at university and by our culture is to live from the outside in. So if I have this, then I will feel that. It's all about the external. But actually life works the other way around. We need to in ourselves believe that we are capable and confident and be in our power in order to attract those things. So for example, you're not going to become CEO or to make partner unless internally you have that belief in yourself. So we need to look at what we're trying to do on the outside, but it's as important, if not more so, to look at what's going on on the inside of ourselves. We are all born powerful, but we get caught up in our identity, our egoic self, and that tells us that we are not powerful. So if you look at children and you ask them what they want to be one day, you know, children think that they could be anything, do anything. They don't have limits. They want to be superheroes. But somewhere along the line, through years of schooling and our parenting, we disconnect from our power and we start to then live from our identity. So which is a collection of beliefs, very often based on our wounds of our childhood. And this becomes a filter through which we view our lives. And we carry around, for example, could be some experience with a teacher when you were seven years old and you were called to, you know, recite something you were supposed to have learned the night before in front of the class. And as a result, you, you know, you couldn't remember it and you were humiliated. You may carry that humiliation because of the neural wiring with you your whole life and believe that I can't speak in public and that I am not good enough and that I am not good at this. And very often it was just a momentary thing. You know, it happened when you were seven and yes, maybe you, you were you're put on the spot. But the sad thing is that we, we carry these stories with us. So we need to start looking at the stories we're carrying, do a little bit of that subconscious, you know, digging to see what is affecting us in the now and what stories can we let go of so that we can birth new stories and new visions and move into being a more powerful version of ourselves, not held back by the past and our limitations. It's very interesting to look at left brain versus right brain. So lawyers, you know, are considered to be logical and left brain. But and that's how, if you struggle to remember them, that's the way I always remember it. It's like logical is left brain, logical, linear, left brain. And then the right brain is the creative side. But there are huge numbers of lawyers who are immensely creative and need to come up with creative solutions to things all the time. And it's not actually healthy to work on only one side of your brain. So it doesn't mean everybody can be an artist or, you know, paints, but it does mean that we need for full brain functioning to really be in our power. We need to harness both sides of the brain. So the problem with law is that we're trained. You must use your intellect to understand everything. But so much of what I'm talking about today is not really understandable with the intellect. So stepping into your power actually means stepping outside of logic and rationality and reason. You're not going to fully grasp this concept of power until you're ready to move out of the left brain. That is my firm belief. Where else can power come from? Well, I think that the true source of power is the infinite source of life. You may know this infinite source of life by a name. You may call it God or Allah or Yahweh or Jehovah, or maybe you call it the universe. Today, I'm not doing a religious lecture by any means because I respect that there are many paths, but I believe that we do need to acknowledge that there is some power that's greater than ourselves, that we are as little human beings, we're not at the center of the universe. We are not controlling everything. And another way to look at this, is that our power comes on the one hand we've got the small self okay so the identity the egoic self and that one is based in fear so it's fear of not being good enough fear of not earning enough money fear of not being safe fear of not being respected 
And then you've got this other self, which is your, your greatness and your higher self or your self with a capital S. And when you tap into that, it's extraordinary what you're actually capable of. So when you tap into that greater power, that's when you can be in jail for 27 years and you can come out filled with love and hope, ready to reunite a country. That's the hope. That is the power that can move mountains. When you step out of the identity or egoic self and into your higher self, your greater self. So power comes with awareness. The ability to separate your identity from your higher self, your spirit. So even while you can still feel that your emotions are maybe being triggered, if you're able to witness this, that's what awareness is. You're able to see it happening and go, gosh, look at myself, instead of being completely consumed by whatever that trigger is. So being able to have that slight distinction and see what it is you are doing and catch yourself in time, hopefully before you've acted out, but sometimes it's after that. So if you can subtly sense, oh, I'm feeling disempowered, this situation has triggered me, that's enough to insert like a little shaft of light into what could become quite a dark situation if you act out from your identity. Because we all know that, that someone's triggered us and then we have erupted and it ends up being a really horrible, uncomfortable, destructive situation. We damage the relationship, we say things that we didn't mean. So all we need is that pause, that moment when we catch ourselves and have that sense of just awareness, like a little gap where we're not consumed and we go, oh, this has triggered me. I'm going to choose to act in a different way. So that's why I call it, if you're able to pause, that that's like having a little shaft of light into what is the darkness. So the darkness is when we act in ways of which we're not proud later, behavior that causes us shame, so I'm not saying that you should seek enlightenment or try and be, you know, some Zen master who never gets triggered by anything. It's just that in that ability to pause, that's where our power lies. And great people have that. I was listening to a talk by Deepak Chopra the other day, and he said he never gets angry anymore, ever. He said, you can ask my family, I never get angry because something in me has changed that I don't need to take on whatever anybody else does anymore. And I thought, wow, now that, that sounds next level enlightenment. So power comes from awareness, the power of pause. But most of our lives, we kind of live on automatic pilot. So we are just run on these scripts that we're not even aware of that are like playing out as if they're computer games. Um, this sort of programming from our cultural and societal condition and our family and all of those wounds, like these scripts are just playing this constantly feeling like I'm not good enough, I need to do more, I have to achieve in order to be loved. There's all this stuff which can drive us to burnout and overwork, and then we're not in our power. So we are able to reprogram ourselves. That's the good news, okay? That's the miracle of life. Change is not going to come from your intellect. The intellect is tied up with the identity, okay? The identity always wants to know. The identity wants to know how. So whenever you're thinking, how is this gonna work? How am I gonna do this? How, how, how? All of those how questions are coming from your identity. They're not coming from you being fully in your power and trusting that your higher self has a plan. And I'm not saying you sit back. Um, you absolutely have a huge amount of work to do. So it's not about sitting back and just letting something you know, take over but it's about not getting caught up in those scripts, about being calm and centered and listening to that deep intuitive voice that helps you know what the next right thing to do or say is. So the change you seek, which is hopefully a movement to greater inner peace so that you do feel at peace and in your power. And who doesn't wanna feel less anguished and more at peace in the world? That change will come not from thinking, but by stepping into awareness a greater awareness of yourself, yourself with a capital S. And I think that Susan Dykoff's book, Lawyer Know Thyself, is a wonderful place to start because it's all, as you can see there, it's a psychological analysis of personality, strengths, and weaknesses. And it's all about lawyers. And it's fascinating to understand the different types of lawyer personalities that they are 
and why people are drawn to the legal field, um, what burnout you know, looks like, why it's so high, why is depression and a more pessimistic view on life so prevalent amongst lawyers. It is a treasure trove of information. So I encourage people to look at themselves, not as just the egoic identity self, you know, which is like the wounded version of you. And maybe you had an abusive dad or you had a bully of a teacher or someone in your life. But think of yourself actually as a being who came here to do important work on this planet. You came here for a reason and you've got work to heal conflict or to seek justice for wrongs that should never have been committed. And this is not something that you can learn in a book. You may read about the concept, but what you actually need is experience. This is not just going to come from here. It's going to come from here. Moving from your head into your heart. And there's a wonderful indigenous American saying, which is that the longest journey you will ever make is the journey from your head to your heart. And if you truly want to be in your power, you are going to need to make that journey from your head into your heart. That does certainly doesn't mean being governed by your emotions, as I've been explaining, but it's about harnessing the power of both. That extraordinary intuitive knowing from a higher source combined with your extraordinary intellect, those together, that's true power. So step into the wild, into nature, where your thoughts can cease for a while and you can reconnect with your body and not just be in your mind. It doesn't have to mean climbing a mountain. It can just mean walking in a park in your city. It can just mean getting out of the office to feel sunshine on your face during, um, during your lunch break, feeling grass under your feet, just stepping outside of that sometimes heaviness of human identity and the craziness of the whirring mind, the phones, the technology that keeps us plugged in and switched on endlessly. You're not going to tap into the true higher self when you are constantly on that hamster wheel with the brain going. You need to step out into nature, breathe, slow things down, and then you will feel that's when your best ideas start to come of how to solve problems. So even great lawyers find that solutions to cases come when they're in the shower or going for a walk, hours sitting at your desk. That's not when inspiration strikes you. It needs to come sometimes from another place and you need to allow space so that your best thinking can come through. If your mind is always filled and you're always on your phone or reading a magazine or on just constant input, that space isn't there for your true creative power to actually come through, for your best ideas to come that are gonna guide you. So the energy, if you work in places like courts, can be quite heavy and it's easy to become filled with despair if you don't consciously speak, seek out space in which you can spend time with who you really are. We mistakenly believe that we are separate from each other, that I'm over here and you are over there in your body. And we've been under this separation illusion our whole lives. But know that it's not actually like that in all cultures. Because the word Ubuntu says that I am because you are. And there are similar words in many indigenous cultures. Africa is not the only country to have a word like that, or South Africa. So in many parts of the world, children are actually raised differently to know that we are connected, that you belong to a group, that you belong to a tribe, and that what is done to one person is done to all. But somehow in the modern world, we've really moved away from that. We've chosen to turn our back on this knowing. So we isolate, we yearn for connection, yet we feel alone. And alone, we are fearful. We fear for our survival. We fear that we won't be loved. We fear that we are not good enough. Those are all fears of the human identity. So transcending that fear is possible, but it's difficult. So it's not entirely that you're never going to be afraid again, but as you come to know yourself with the capital S, your higher self, your true self, then you come to feel less alone because you know that you are actually held by something that's much greater than you. You tap into a source of power that you may not have known existed. It is the power that moves mountains. It is the power that parts oceans. 
and it is a power which can open hearts and minds. Your legal career may take you in many directions, many of which will give you huge power over other people's lives. Whether you're doing commercial law transactions or you're doing divorce work or adoption work or um, any sort of family law work really, but you are, even with deceased estates, you have power over people's lives. And that is a sacred responsibility. So this now, is your choice. To stay small in fear, believing that only with force can you control or do dominate people who are bad or who are wrongdoers, or whether you choose to open to this extraordinary power of love. And it doesn't mean weakness. It doesn't mean ignoring just injustice or condoning acts of violence. So working with the power of love is, is not about ignoring what is bad in the world, but it does mean this. It means seeing in every human the spark of the divine being that he or she truly is. And even when you are incapable of seeing it. So, for example, with magistrates who deal with some of the most heinous crimes, where it seems impossible to see the humanity in that criminal who is before you, even then, can you hold yourself open to trusting that this person in front of you who committed this crime, this person is also a child of God or of Allah or of Yahweh. And can you ask whatever you call this infinite creator of everything, just the willingness to see this person differently, the willingness to see their humanity and their divinity, because just the willingness to do so can change you. When I shared this um, talk two years ago with a group of magistrates, before I had shared my message, I asked all of the magistrates to share an example of being in their power. And one magistrate, a young magistrate stood up and said she'd had a really difficult experience the day before where she'd had to sentence somebody to a very long sentence and she explained how difficult she found that because you're incarcerating somebody for a very long time, you know, effectively ending, almost ending their life. This man had beaten his wife senseless. But at the end of the proceedings, when she sentenced him, he thanked her and she wasn't sure that he'd understood. So she said, hold on, before he was, um, you know, asked to leave the courtroom, she said, I don't know if you've understood the sentence. And he said, Yes, I have, but I, I thanked you and I just want to say something to you. I want to thank you because you are the first person who has treated me as a human, as a person in so many years. And he said, even through this court case, you saw me and you treated me with respect. And I want to thank you for that. And I understand my sentence. And she was deeply moved by this. And the extraordinary thing is that the message I was yet to carry in the, in the talk that I'd already prepared was exactly this, was this thing of seeing the humanity and the divinity in the person before you. And so I knew then that I'd been guided to share that, um, to share the message. And she was guided to share her story, although I, neither of us knew before, before that day. So I share that with you to let you know that as an illustration of the enormous power that lawyers have and the sanctity of this work and how you need to really look at the responsibility of entering the legal profession and how you need to be in your power to do that work. And as you can see from her story, it's not just about the intellect, it's about being in your heart as well. Um, the picture there is Kimberly Stamatelos, who wrote a book called The Compassionate Lawyer, and I also can't recommend that enough. Kimberly is a, uh, works with high conflict divorce cases um, and brings an extraordinary amount of heart into her work. She really does understand the holistic approach to law. So you have power beyond your knowing. And what I'm going to say to you today is don't numb out because you can only access this power if you open yourself. And most of us choose to remain closed. So we close off as a result of fear. We numb ourselves with whatever we've chosen, which is TV or drugs or alcohol or sex or shopping, relationships, social media. So here is your choice. You can remain closed and powerless, 
or you can risk opening yourself to connect with the source of all power. You do not need to become religious. You don't need to attend church or synagogues or mosque. I mean, you can if you choose, but in the texts of whatever path, if you look at any, any religious path, any spiritual path, you will see the same lessons that I'm talking to you about here, about opening your heart, opening your mind, and moving out of just this intellect, which wants to make sense of everything. Because that's the smaller part of us. Of course, there's risk. There is risk that you are going to feel too much, that the world and all its pain will enter your already fragile body in ways that you feel you cannot hold. But the alternative is that you stay closed and that you stay fearful. And because you don't allow those emotions to pass through you, then they become stuck in you, like a record that can only play one note again and again, and that is all you will know. So open instead to the symphony that can be yours. The full range of human experience, coursing through your veins and pulsing through your heart, giving you the power you need to open the hearts and minds of others, all those that you will come into contact with during your legal career, to bring healing to the troubled minds that present themselves before you in such pain, in such shame, and in great conflict, both inner and outer. Your ability to see the light in them may be exactly what is needed for them to see the light in themselves, maybe for the first time. You can be in a miracle worker. You are in a position to do this. So you have a choice. And today what I'm asking you to do is choose the power of love. Remember times maybe where you have felt powerful and that can be a very useful way to bring that into your energy. So maybe call to mind a situation can you think of one now in which you felt that you were fully in your power, where you felt in touch with that extraordinary power within you? So maybe a situation where you just achieved some desired result, almost as if it you know, were by miracle, not where you had to force it and spend hours. Can you think of something now? A moment of feeling truly in your power. If you can, I want you to close your eyes and just visualize that moment now. And turn particularly to how it felt on the inside. How did that feel in your body? Where did you feel the power in your body? So think about the situation, hold it. And if you can't, maybe later you can come back to this. And choose a symbol that can represent that feeling. Is there a symbol that you can think of that would help you to remember that moment? And maybe you can find an image of that, print it out, Google search something, and put it up as a symbol for you of being in your power. And maybe you can use that symbol whenever you're going into a situation that's challenging to help you remember to stay in your power. So to finish today, I want to say you may need to do some therapy or coaching to uncover where you've given away your power in the past, power that you may not have reclaimed. You may need to examine your current relationships carefully to see where the balance of power is not aligned to your highest self. Because you will need to become aware of the value you ascribe to yourself. And this is evidenced by how you treat yourself which is why self-care is not a frivolous subject. It is a critical factor in the impact that you have upon the world. So how you treat yourself is going to really determine how in your power you are because the value you ascribe to yourself is shown by that. If you cannot value yourself, if you cannot value yourself and you give away too much in order to be loved, accepted, or just to keep everyone else happy, you will end up becoming invaded energetically and your power has been removed. So I want you to start today by observing yourself and making a commitment to stepping back into your power. I hope that this has been useful. I'd welcome questions, so please feel free to reach out and we can continue the conversation on our social media platforms. Good luck with stepping into your power.
Evans. Out. Out. Right. 